Lucas, thanks so much for coming to the podcast. Great to have you here. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. What's my line? You can say... <laughs> I'm, 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 just I'm just messing with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You really got me there, okay? You really got me. (laughs) Hello, friends. Welcome to Audiobook Reviews in 5. This is Jana, also known as Jana. In today's extended episode, I'm sitting down with Lucas Cantor. Lucas is a podcaster, composer, producer, multi-instrumentalist, and speaker. He has worked in NBC's music department for eight Olympic Games, for which he won two Emmys in 2008 and 2012. He co-produced Lord's cover of Everybody Wants to Rule the World, found on the Hunger Games Catching Fire soundtrack. Lucas is also an avid reader. He hosts his own show, The Book Society Podcast, which features weekly conversations with fascinating guests from diverse backgrounds. Lucas and I are both passionate about great storytelling and history. Our conversation today includes friendly disagreements about Malcolm Gladwell's Bomber Mafia, frequent references to Middlemarch by George Eliot, and the dynamics and design of audiobooks and podcasting. Lucas also mentions a few words about his June 11th podcast conversation with water rights lawyer and journalist Zach Smith, which you can find linked in my show notes. And now I bring you, for real this time, Lucas Cantor. Lucas, thanks so much for coming to the show. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. You have quite an established career in music. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was looking at your your bio. You've got some really incredible credentials to your name. And I heard you talking to Ju- Julian in, in one of your mm-hmm. podcasts, and he mentioned something about, you know, composers or people in music talking about books and literature. And so I wondered if this was a project specifically that you had set out to combine or uh, explore books as a musician or somebody who works in music. How did it come about that you started this podcast? Yeah, the the two things are kind of unrelated. Um, Basically, I, I've always been a writer and a reader. Even when I was in music school, I just loved writing and I loved reading and I and I didn't do much writing, but I've done more in the last several years. And uh, and this started really as a kind of a pandemic project. I was doing a lot of Zoom happy hours with my friends and realizing that we were all having a little bit more time to read and having these really interesting conversations. And I thought, I should just, you know, record these, basically. Yeah. And so, uh, so it just kind of snowballed from there. It started as a you know, the idea is that I would just kind of interview my friends and maybe have four or five people that we would just cycle through. And um, I really got a lot of interest from from a lot of different people about it. And it's just one of those projects that, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm getting a project off the ground and I'm fighting it at every turn and just really trying to make it work and having to expend a lot of energy just to keep it alive. And this one kind of feels like I came up with the idea, the, the Book Society podcast, I came up with the idea and people just started showing up asking to help. So um, so it's just one of those it's one of those uh, sort of happy projects. And it's really easy for me. I have a, a guy who's my music assistant um, also edits the podcast. And that's an era of his expertise that I do, you know, which is interesting. So for me, I really just I read the book. I do all the correspondence with the guests because some of them are, you know, sort of high powered intellectuals. And I don't want to, you know, I want to <laughs> be dealing with them personally um, or, you know, public intellectuals, I should say. Um, sure. And. So I do all the correspondence with the guests and stuff. But then the podcast is, you know, we read the book, we talk about it for an hour. And then um, Santiago, my producer, edits it and makes me sound coherent and articulate. <laughs> and uh, and that's that's it. So it's it's been really fun. And it's been I've had some really interesting guests and some and I've read some really interesting books as a result of it that I wouldn't have otherwise found. What were some of the surprises for you that you you pick something up and you thought, eh, I probably won't enjoy this. And then you turned out to love it. Um, I'll, 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 several of them. Um, Middlemarch, the episode I did with Julian, was the, this was a book that um, I think I read when I was in my 20s and I just didn't just didn't like resonate for me. I thought it was kind of boring. And I, I just didn't get it. And now I preach the gospel of Marianne Evans, also known as George Eliot, 
to anyone who will listen. It's just a fantastic book. And if you haven't read it, you should read it. And if you have read it, you should read it again. And okay, I need to read it again. Yeah, but definitely. I love I loved your conversation with Judith Dupre about there has to be like a maturity rating or a milestone rating. You should read this at age 20 and then again at 40 and really coming back to certain ideas. Oh, oh that's so true because there's certain books I hated when I was younger and I thought, who would ever want to read this? This is terrible. Um, and then there's other ones that I think I come back to and like, you know what? This is still good. And it has aged well. <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, there's this, um, there's a like sort of, in pop culture, there's this idea, especially among creative people, that if something is popular, then it must not be that good, right? And I think that that is to some degree probably true of things that are new, but something like Middlemarch that has been popular and a classic for a hundred years, it's going to have something to it. And yeah. that's, I, I've noticed that it's just any classic that you read, they're, they're always interesting and they're always, they're always good. It's just, I think it's, you have to come at it a certain way, but books don't stay around in the popular culture and don't continue to be printed for a century if they don't speak to um, at least something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, and you made a great observation uh, in, in that, in that same interview, I think you said something along the lines of, you know, people think that, you know, back in the 19th century, there was all these great writers around and they, they forget that there was a lot of pulp and trash around too. It just literally did not last. It yeah. literally decomposed and it doesn't exist anymore. Nobody's printed it again because it wasn't worth reprinting. And that's something that I was nodding my head and thought, yes, this is so true because I studied English literature for my for my degree and people really have this notion of the canon and like the great works. But in reality, average people weren't necessarily reading all of those things. They were reading the Penny Dreadfuls and the broadsheets and the, you know, the the shock and awe stories about Jack the Ripper, or, or whatever nothing. it may be. Or nothing. Yeah. yeah. Or nothing. Or the Bible. That was always <laughs> a solid choice. But yeah, it's, um, I think we sometimes have a yeah, bit if of... You, if, you like, yeah. if you like murder, vengeful deities, and like, you know, a lot of fantasy, the Bible is a great choice. Exactly. Timeless. Mm -hmm. Timeless classic. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about was your opinion on audiobooks in terms of books made better through narrator performance and audio design. Specifically, and that's why I was so excited actually to ask you about Bomber Mafia, because Malcolm Gladwell has taken that whole production value of his podcast, Revisionist History. It's got original music, tons of fact checkers, original archival footage recordings. It is just so beautifully put together. It is like next level audiobook. And I listen to that and I think this is what so many audiobooks could be. But we're still tapped into this very old idea of someone writes a book and then someone sits down and reads it. And if you're lucky, they, they're a decent actor and they can perform it well, but there's no appreciation for what music can bring to it or the sound design or those elements. And I'm just thinking there's so much potential here because audiobooks are taking off. People want to listen to audiobooks, but the production is still very basic and conservative. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think um, I think I completely disagree with you on this, which is uh, oh, which is great. So, okay, cool. I, uh, and part of the reason that I haven't finished Bomber Mafia yet, we were talking about it, I think, off air, is that I I just I, l let me start by saying I would never say anything bad about Malcolm Gladwell or his writing or his work. I think everything he does is absolutely fantastic. But for me, Bomber Mafia is too much production, and part of mm. what you get, um, and it's not too much production for a piece of audio theater. It's too much production for a book. Mm -hmm. So um, what when you read a book, all of the imagery and all of the sounds and the smells and the feeling of being somewhere or the feeling of inhabiting someone else's train of thought and someone else's idea is left to your imagination. And that is what, to me, is beautiful about books, is that it really forces you to engage with a piece of art. And a book really doesn't meet you halfway. It makes you come to it. And uh, something like radio or television or film are the opposite of end of that extreme. Radio to some degree because you still have to visualize, but film really makes almost every decision for you. And the only surprise that film can really give you is plot twists. Mm -hmm. But everything else is, is visual. You know, it, it's, it envelops all of your senses. I guess you can't smell films yet, but they're, they're working on it, I'm sure. And <laughs> so to have a production like Bomber Mafia 
doesn't it just doesn't feel like a book to me. It feels like a really fantastic long form podcast, which is mm-hmm. something that I very much enjoy, but is not the same experience. And for me, it was a little jarring when I read it as a when I found it as an audiobook. His last book, um, The Talking to Strangers, yeah. sort of walked that line where it was a little bit of a production, but it was still an audiobook. And I, I mean, I, I just I really love that book and that really worked for me. But I mm-hmm. think that there's, I just think that they're different mediums. And I mean, when you're talking about a long form audiobook with sound design and actors and performances and Foley, it's really just kind of a radio show, isn't it? Sure. I mean, I'd be happy to call it any name. I just loved it. Like for me, it was just, it brought it to life. It brought the history to life because I want to hear that archival footage. I don't want to just read it flat on a page or have an actor read it if I have the original recording. Um, Some of these characters like Curtis LeMay, like they're just, they're so iconic. And for me, because it's nonfiction, that brings history to life. Now, if it were fiction, maybe I'd feel differently. I'd say like, let me do some of the imagination. Let me kind of craft how I want to see this. But honestly, I love that audiobook so much. I listened to it twice. And I was like, he could have had this 15 hours and I would have listened to it. And I just finished listening to um, Empire of Pain by, um, it's about the Sackler family. And I listened to it like one and a half times and it's 15 hours. Now it's not the full scale production. It's more of a traditional audiobook, but the storytelling is just phenomenal. And then the narrative performance is so, so good. Not over the top, but he captures the tone and the cadence of the emotions and the characters enough that you never feel like this guy's reading it's always, this is a performance. And I feel like that's a really key element of audiobooks for me. Um, and maybe, so I have a really strong opinion on authors shouldn't necessarily be the readers. And I, it drives me bananas when I hear people say, oh, well, the author read it, so it's better. Like, no, the author wrote it. The author's a writer, has nothing to do whether they're a decent performer. Just like if you say, just because somebody composes a piece of music doesn't make them the best player. Like, I and maybe you <laughs> there's an album with that. called Antonio Carlos Jobim plays, or it's called The Composer of Desipanado Plays, and it is kind of notorious in the jazz community as like a <laughs> okay. I, I mean, he's got a vibe, but he's certainly not the best of any of the instruments that he plays. Yeah, um, yeah. So I feel like there's great authors, and if you get the training. Um, And like, let's say you're someone like David Attenborough in the Mm -hmm. UK. He knows how to breathe. He knows how to control his voice. He knows how to have to bring the right cadence to what he's saying. So his audiobook is going to bring that performance. So I'd love to hear what you think if if you've got an opinion on that, because I it's rare that you can get an author who can perform their work really, really well. There's competent. Well, readings. Malcolm Gladwell is a perfect yeah. example. Exactly. He's but he's fantastic. a podcaster. Yeah. yeah, he's a podcaster, right? Yeah, so, but he's, a, he's an author first. I mean, he's a, yeah. you know, he's a New Yorker, Atlantic author first. And yeah. it just so happens he's an excellent public speaker. And I think because he had a proclivity towards public speaking, he got asked to do it a lot. And so now he's really, really, really great at it. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. probably, you know, top 10 in the world. And so, yeah, I think it depends on what you're reading. I, I like a... um. Oh, I have a few favorite audiobook performances. One is A Visit from the Goon Squad, read by mm-hmm. Roxana Ortega. And, okay. you know, it's fiction. It's Jennifer Egan's book about um, music and sort of Gen X uh, life. It's great. It's a fantastic book. It's sort of vignette short stories. And Roxana Ortega reads it like, like she reads an audiobook like Meryl Streep plays a part. It's just it's totally transparent. You don't feel like there's acting happening, which is really shaping the story in a beautiful way. Um, my other favorite audiobook performance and favorite audiobook reader is a guy named Derek Perkins, who does a lot of history mm-hmm. audiobooks. He does, um, he's read Paul Krewichek's Babylon, which is the history of ancient Babylon from 4,000 BC to about 1,000, or, or to about the, you know, to about the Greeks, so about zero. And Mm. he also read this great book called Carthage Must Be Destroyed, which is a sort of unknown history of the Punic Wars and of Carthage in general. And he's British and just has this very authoritative flat. And by flat, I mean, not kind of not really telling you what to pay attention to, but he has this way of reading audiobooks and still leaving you a lot of room to interpret, but not being boring. And part of that is he just has a fantastic accent. But (laughs) um, yeah, so I, I think that it depends especially when you're reading history, and this is maybe why we disagree on Bomber Mafia, is 
it's very, you know, history is very political and history is very interpretive. And the more information you're getting that is not fact, the more your perception of historical events is being shaped to the author or the producer's vision. Mm -hmm. And that is something that in our society, I think, is going, goes less and less noticed with every passing year that when you're watching something on television, you're not seeing a collection of facts. You're seeing an opinion with some facts thrown in there. And, Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same thing, just, you know, the more production you get, the less decisions you have to make. And so as entertainment, that's great because when you want to be entertained, you don't want to make a lot of decisions, but as information, it's, it's less interesting or it's it's Mm -hmm. less robust. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that's my opinion. Yeah. I think there's a good perspective there because if you didn't know anything about the second world war, you listened to the bomber mafia and you took that as a definitive history that might leave you a bit lopsided in if, terms of if, how you understood things. If you didn't right? know anything about the Second World War and you listened to the Bomber Mafia, you still wouldn't know anything about the Second World War. Yeah, it's it's quite, you know, no pun intended, but it's a deep dive on a very niche topic. Right. And it's clearly entertaining, and that's why he picked it. I guess for me, because I've read so much about the Second World War, I was looking for a fresh take. Mm-hmm. Um, every time I see something that comes out about the Second World War, and it's recommended, I hesitate because I'm like, "Mm, there's been a lot written about the Second World War. And so that bar is so high to to make anything interesting or relevant. And it's there's always an agenda. Like you say, people have their own interpretation. Um, History textbooks are constantly updated, even every decade. And so for me, it's I do take it with that grain of salt. Like I say, this is Malcolm Gladwell's branding and it has his own personal story because his, you know, he's got his father's background in the beginning. If you if you read the beginning, you remember mm-hmm. his his father had that experience. Um, but you know, there's there's not everything there that someone might list listening to this isn't gonna say if if they happen to be in the Air Force, I don't know that they would say, Oh yeah, this 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 taught me something. So it's it is a bit of a superficial story in a sense, um, and he's very carefully picked out some very entertaining pieces. But um, I, yeah, I, I mean, I can see how you're saying with a production style that can also make it feel very comprehensive and polished and finished. And this is this is its own thing, um, and you're not necessarily given you know guidance on you should read this and you should look into this and you should understand this other area. Uh, you know, I, I think there's there's nothing wrong with popular history and there's nothing wrong with history that's ent- entertaining. And I think at, at worst, it gives people some sort of idea of something that might have happened. And at mm-hmm. best, it leads people into a more serious study. And I've, you know, for me, my I sort of, I came to understanding and liking history through listening to Mike Duncan's History of Rome podcast, which nice. is a pretty surface level narrativization of um, the decline and fall of the Roman empire. It's fantastic. It is a fantastic podcast. He's a fantastic podcaster. And I don't mean to say surface level as a pejorative. It's just, there's a Mm -hmm. lot of information and he tries to divvy it up into 20 minute chunks. And so, but listening to that and sort of getting the overview of Roman history from 500 BC until, or even further back until uh, about 400 AD, gave me this framework to understand more detailed, more nuanced, more academic pieces of history in a context that I wouldn't have otherwise had. So Mm -hmm. they're, so they're all, they're all really important. And it's, it's really great to, if you know a little bit about the second world war, it makes bomber mafia a lot more robust Uh, the same way that if you know a little bit about, um, like if you've read Paul Krivichek's Babylon, you're by no means an expert in Mesopotamian history, but you can listen to, you can read about Roman history and think, Oh, right. That was, I, I vaguely know what was going on in the eastern part of the empire at this time because there was a whole other civilization doing a whole other thing. Otherwise, history starts to seem like it all exists in a bubble, mm-hmm. um, which mm-hmm. it doesn't. There, everybody is, Every civilization is interdependent on every other one or affects every yeah. other one. Yeah. So going back to your idea, though, about keeping books separate from audio production as like a radio play or an audio documentary, what do you feel about music being used in audiobooks or audio production? Like, it sounds like you you really like that separate book experience. Even if it's an audiobook, you want that sort of stripped down performance. Um, 
not necessarily like they use the word flat before, like there's a bit of restraint. It's not over the top production. Mm -hmm. It's not over dramatized. And do you feel that that lends itself to that same experience of reading a book of, you know, using your imagination, filling in the blanks, filling in the scene. And so you're trying to take that same experience of reading a book, but you want to deliver that audible in an audible way. Um, is that uh, that, sort that's of what I like to. That's what I like to listen to in, in audiobooks. I, I, I'm not. Yeah. I, I'm not trying to dictate what anyone else should enjoy. I think everybody is sure. going to enjoy what they're going to enjoy, and that's fine. I, I would. I guess I would be sad if all audiobooks were produced like, like that from Muffin. now on. Yeah. If that just became the standard, I'm. I'm perfectly happy for that to be another genre of audiobook or a type of audiobook that yeah. is available because it's interesting and it's fantastic. You know, there's a lot you can do with just sound, but. I know firsthand because it's my job that music can be emotionally manipulative. That is why yeah. it is in media. Exactly. Um, so, so yeah, <laughs> you're you're definitely telling someone what what musicians do. What music does in media is manipulate subtext. So, mm -hmm. music doesn't often say anything outright. It just says what you should be thinking about what is happening, mm -hmm. and that is more information than I think you want to give an audience if you're trying to give them an unbiased account of something like history. It is mm. probably pretty useful if you want to give them a, an account of some fiction, but it also takes a lot of the nuance and uh, a lot of the subtlety out of what I think is beautiful about fiction. I'm just thinking about mm. reading Middlemarch to take it back to one of my favorite books. Sure. And if you had, you know, some sweet pastoral music playing under Dorothea and Casabon, that would fit maybe in the moment, but it doesn't really make sense for their relationship because you can't really capture their relationship in a single piece of music. And no. so, and so just the, the idea of reading, reading through that relationship in Middlemarch and realizing when you get to the end of it, that all of your ideas of the beginning of it were maybe a little bit wrong hmm. is powerful. Yeah. And I think it would be less powerful if that was telegraphed through music. I'd agree. Yeah. I don't think music would add much or it could actually detract from Middlemarch. But I do disagree with you that history is objective. Like, I don't think you can have an objective historic document because no matter who's writing it, they've got their biases, they've got their blind spots, there's things they don't know about, there's things they're coming to it, that they have their own value, right? So mm -hmm. for me, I, that's how I read history. That's how I interpret history. It's always okay, this, this author has an agenda, whether or not they're aware of it. And that's okay. Like we're human. We're not going to be perfectly objective. But I don't mind those emotional nuances being put in because I do feel like history is an interpretation. So it's kind of like, okay, this is somebody's exciting journey into a part of history that they personally find interesting. And so they made it into a production. Um, so that's, I guess that's where I'm coming from. Well, I think we're in agreement that I, I don't yeah. think history is objective. I think that's why yeah. it seems manipulative to me to put, to tell these stories in such entertaining mm -hmm. ways, if that makes sense. Now, not that I don't think yeah. history should be entertaining, but that it's, um, that it, to, to, to dramatize it can really make something resonate with you emotionally and once mm -hmm. something resonates with someone emotionally the facts of it are out the window so if you i mean there is there is no way i could stand here and make a case that hitler had some really good ideas about bureaucracy right because just the, the mention of hitler there's nothing you could say good about hitler for for good reason and i don't think that you know but like it's such an emotional hot button issue mm -hmm. because it's recent and there are survivors of the horrible horrible things that he perpetrated that it's it's not possible to look at it objectively. And um, mm -hmm. when you, you know, if I, like you could present any piece of history from Sargon's empire up until World War II as a morality play about United States partisan politics. And you could do that, especially with music and sound effects. And that doesn't mean that that's true. It just means that that narrative conclusion is possible to draw from the scant facts that we have about that period. It's also mm -hmm. true that completely different narrative conclusions are possible to draw from the scant facts that we have about mm -hmm. this period. I should also say that um, I promised myself months ago when I was on podcast that like my one rule was don't talk about Hitler. Okay. You can leave it yeah. in. I don't think I said anything nice about him. But it's just we'll leave it. Hitler there. We'll leave <laughs> Hitler there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I, I get what you're saying, I think, but 
yeah, like once you bring certain topics up, it's just you ruined it. Like you can't you, you can't paint it anything other than you know verboten. But because I do think history is subjective, I kind of I don't mind if someone wants to try and emotionally manipulate me because history is emotional. Like mm -hmm. it's not it's not a stark um, logical series of facts. Like people are emotional and I don't think people are fundamentally rational. So studying history to me is always just about understanding incentives and human emotion and why do people behave the way they do? And that's why I've, I've listened to so many books about behavioral psychology, social psychology. You know, one of the most recent ones I read was The Quick Fix, I released last week. And he goes through a number of very popular social psychology, behavioral psychology study findings and finds this is based on very, very thin premises or just completely manipulated science. So my problem with it is we're spending, you know, millions, sometimes billions of dollars on these programs. You know, I work in the corporate world in my day to day life and there's anti-bias training and there's, you know, anti-racism training. Uh, back in the early days, I you know, I did the power posing thing to like feel confident, <laughs> like I'm a superwoman. And all of like a lot of this has been disproven or at least called into question. Now, do I feel stupid for power posing? Yes. But hey, it seemed harmless at the time. Right. So it wasn't hurting yeah. anyone. You probably didn't lose anything by doing it. Other yeah, than, you just, know, maybe some dignity, but just no. my dignity yeah. in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's really interesting to see, you know, how we define objectivity and science and and fact uh, and and so it's always evolving. There's always this subjectivity. And I think it's really important to always remind ourselves everything is subjective, no matter what we're listening to, no matter how how frankly or 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 clearly someone claims to be objective and saying this is the truth, nothing but the facts. You know, you can have fact checking up the wazoo, but you're always coming to it with an agenda, including, you know, this empire of pain well, book I mean, the th family. There are facts. Yeah. Oh, no, there are. You know, but yeah. So it's uh, sorry, I'm not trying to be an ultimate relativist like, oh, there's no truth. You can't understand the world. It's all nihilism. No, uh, sorry. That's that sounded like where I was going, I realized. But I, I think there's always this emotional underpinning mm -hmm. to everything that I was like, OK, what's this author really all about? And um, even Malcolm Gladwell, you know, he's he got he's gotten caught up in his own momentum with things like the 10,000 hour rule, which has been called into question. Sure. Um, I so mean, that wasn't even his, I mean, yeah. that wasn't his research. It wasn't he was his, just reporting but, on he, it. but he made it popular, right? Yeah. He popularized it. So, and again, then you can have the whole argument of do authors have to be responsible for what they popularize? Like grit with Angela Duckworth. Sure. Oh my gosh, grit is everywhere to this day. You know, I write corporate communications. But, if there but isn't that, was one her, reference, that was her yeah, research. Though. That was her yeah. though. But lots of people took that idea and they conflated it with other things or they kind of muddled it and they didn't necessarily refer back to her research. And so <laughs> she's the grit woman that everyone's like, well, you're responsible for this idea. But, you know, she's she's put it out there and she's made it famous, but it's kind of taken on a life of its own. Right. Well, Yana, this is exactly my point, is that you can yeah. listen to an episode of Radio Lab and walk away feeling like you're an expert in Angela Duckworth's mm -hmm. on Angela Duckworth's work, even though mm -hmm. you've just listened to her talk for seven and a half minutes. So yeah. you clearly don't have a nuanced understanding of what she's saying. You have the headline understanding of what she's saying, which yeah. is unfortunately a lot of people take and run with and consider themselves to be ex experts. And I think mm -hmm. it was Roger Ailes of uh, Fox News who said something to the effect of people don't want to be informed. They want to feel informed. Feel informed. Yeah. Yes. And that that is I mean, that's very true. It's true of me. It's true of every, of everybody. I think people really do want to feel like they're informed and they sometimes take that feeling and run with it when they should be doing some more research. And mm -hmm. I do think that adding an extra emotional component to something that should be history mm -hmm. furthers that it doesn't help with that problem. And that is, oh, you know, okay. in the United States, that is a big problem. People taking yes. something that is emotionally resonant to them and stating it as a fact. That is yeah. pretty much our entire political discourse at this moment. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point. Um, you know, going back to the idea of audiobooks, do you feel that there are certain books that are better as audiobooks or there are certain audiobooks that are much better as written books that you would much rather sit down and read? Yeah, yes, I think that a lot of books are better 
written, I think that because I'm a slow reader and I sub vocalize, there is not a big difference for me. Mm -hmm. Um, reading an audio book or reading a, a written book, I'm working on it. But you know, for a guy who has a podcast about books, I'm a ridiculously slow reader and th <laughs> it's a miracle that I can keep up with the volume, honestly. But that Do was... you ever listen to things on double speed? What's that? Oh, on double speed. I thought you said devil speed. I was like, is that a term? I don't know. <laughs> is that a Canadian thing? <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I can't. Uh, I, I, I don't listen to stuff on double speed. What I, what I usually do, the way I listen to audiobooks, I have two toddlers. So mm -hmm. um, audiobooks are a uh, godsend for me. Like, you know, if I'm walking them and they're kind of sleeping in their cribs, I can put or in their uh, stroller, I can put on an audiobook. I also ride my bike a lot. And so I'll do mm -hmm. an audiobook in one ear while I'm in safe areas of Los Angeles. I, I mean, car, like safe from me getting hit by a car. Um, right. <laughs> and uh, and so so I can or when, I, when I'm on the, you know, just exercising, I can listen to audiobooks. And that's one of the reasons I like them is that I can, do, you know, sort of do two things at, at a time. Um mm -hmm. But I, uh, I think that the, the book I read recently, Ghost Rider, uh, I think that might be better as an audiobook. It's just, okay. it's just so well performed and, um, it really, and it really works. And I, I remember reading it when it came out or right before the movie came out. And it was, it's also great, but the audiobook is just really, really good. Um, and the, let's see, what else, what else have I liked better as an audiobook? Um, I, I think Middlemarch is probably better as a book. As for a book. Example. Yeah. Because yeah. there's just, yeah. you know, the, I, I have listened to an audiobook version of Middlemarch, and, it, and it's fantastic. But th there's something about, you know, I mean, it was written for the page. And I think that, you know, well, when Malcolm Gladwell is writing a book today, um, or me, or anybody who's writing a book, you know that there it's going to be an audiobook. And there is a yeah. part of you that's thinking about that. But obviously, George Orwell... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, George Eliot <laughs> never thought about that when she was writing Middlemarch because that technology didn't exist. Yeah. Well, to be fair, George Orwell, Orwell probably didn't either. So <laughs> yes. you're, you're totally fine on either count. But yeah, that's true. I, I think, though, too, I'm fascinated by the oral tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, human beings have been telling stories out loud much longer than we've been reading stories. And we have this love affair with the novel that goes back to the 18th century. And many of us still love novels, myself included, but that isn't the origin of storytelling. And you know this, of course, because you've got a real interest in ancient history and uh, the oral tradition plays such a huge role in, in, you know, the discourse of, you know, sagas and epics and the way that human beings related important news, behavior, history to each other was largely taken through the oral tradition. So sometimes I wonder, is are audiobooks tapping into that? Do we have this primal sensitivity or desire to hear stories versus read things? I think we might. I think on one level where just hearing information in your ears rather than reading it on a page might have a different cognitive effect. And there's probably some literature on this, I would imagine. I hope. And if, if not, then any academics who listen to this podcast, there you go. There's a thesis for you. That would be a really good one. Um, but I think that um, the audiobooks aren't really an oral tradition. They're okay. they're a they're a written tradition. You're just reading writing, and mm -hmm. the big difference is, uh, you know, we we can study the oral tradition and the myths of ancient Mesopotamia, and those myths had come down in some form, but they mm -hmm. were it, their origin was pretty much lost until we found writing, and so right. the documentation, or the, the myths of a civilization, can tell you who they thought that they were and mm -hmm. how they thought they behaved and how they thought they fit into the world. But the documents of a civilization can tell you what they did and mm -hmm. how they actually behaved in the world. And so those two things are, are and those two things are often very different. If you think about, um, you know, how we would describe Western civilization at our most patriotic, rah, 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 go Canada, um, mm -hmm. or in our most, you know, uh, you know, there is no real ethical consumption under capitalism um, sure. moment. So there's a, yeah, there, there's a big difference. I, I don't think audiobooks tap into an oral mm -hmm. tradition unless, uh, except for maybe psychologically hearing something might sound more true than reading it or mm -hmm. less true than reading it. Well, going back to Malcolm Gladwell, though, this book, The, the Bomber Mafia, was designed as an audio production from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And one of my recent guests, Rachel DeCoste, she has an audiobook based on her journey to Africa. She took a DNA test 
And she wanted to retrace the, the steps of her ancestors. So visit the, the countries where her ancestors came from in Africa. And she had done a bit of a travel blog and she came back and she she heard a lot of feedback and people said, you know what, you should turn this into an audiobook. So she actually sat down and she recorded it without any written material, just based on what she'd remembered. And that got me thinking, what if this became more of a format or, a, you know, it, its own thing? Um, now, some people say that's a podcast. I mean, maybe, maybe that's a podcast, but is there a way to go that down that road and say like maybe there's audiobooks don't just have to be always favoring the written word and someone's reading it i mean this is what nbc was doing before it was mm. a television company i mean this is you know we're just talking about long form radio yeah so and, okay. and i think that that is a lost and very powerful medium and i think that mm-hmm. shows like uh shows shows like freakonomics or um you know all the great like really produced podcasts are bringing that back, and and a lot of those people started as radio and wanting to do, um, wanting to do radio and started on radio and realized that podcasting was just a, you know, a different format where they could accomplish the same thing. But what's the difference between a really well produced Malcolm Gladwell book and a radio documentary from seventy years ago? There's really mm-hmm. no difference other than you can listen to the Malcolm Gladwell book on your own time. You don't have to tune into your radio at a certain time to hear it. True. But True. I, I don't think that this is a. I don't think this is a new medium. It, it seems new because the capabilities that we have to manipulate audio are different than they used to be. And to produce something like uh, like Bomber Mafia or Radio Lab in the 1930s would have been an, a ridiculous expense and a technological marvel. And today, you could... I, I mean, there's a lot of art to making it sound the way that it sounds, but you can make all those sounds with a computer. You know, anyone can really do that and organize them in such a way. I, I'm, again, not denigrating the art of sound designers. There's a real art to making it right. But I don't think they would disagree with me that it's a lot less engineering than it would have been 50 years ago. Oh, yeah. You just have to figure out where the sounds go and have an ear for it and have some training in it rather than having to, yeah. you know, do the math of how to get one sound from this recorder to that recorder and get it all on a tape at the end. Um, True. Fair so enough. yeah, so I think it's a. So I think we're having a. I think this is more of a renaissance of an existing form of audio entertainment than a, than an invention of a new one. Fair enough. I mean, I'm here for it. So I'm glad. I'm yeah. glad about that. Um, I love audio personally because I have to sit for my job so much, and so I've always loved reading. But this liberates me to you know get up, go for a walk, do chores, whatever it may be. And always be listening to something interesting. Mm. And sometimes I listen to things on double speed. It depends how slow the narrator is. You know, sometimes you're really taking things in more for the information. And I find some of the more academic sounding books, it can be a little bit slow. So having it even on 1.2 or 1.3, that can kind of keep me awake <laughs> a little bit more. Um, but it's it's been so uh, wonderful that I just can't get over how popular audiobooks have become and just how much they've made possible for somebody like me to to go around and do my thing and, and like be listening to these great, great works. And it's it's like it's like so easy. I'm super passionate about audiobooks and so that's why I started the podcast. Yeah. And, more people uh, listening, yeah. more people reading books is great. And audio yeah. audio books make that possible. So do you feel like this is a nice balance to your composing music and or composing work or do you feel like like do you feel it complements the work that you do with music or is it something that feels completely different that it's like you get to go into a whole other world yeah it's the same i mean part of mu- music is uh, entertainment and entertainment is storytelling so it's just mm-hmm. it's all it's all one part of the same yeah career and yeah. the same thing it just it does the, the podcast does allow me to talk to some people that would be hard for me to approach just as a composer, you know, but sure. if I approach them as a guy with a podcast, who's also a writer. It's just a little How bit How do you easier. tend to make connections with the people that you've interviewed? Is it through their publicist or through their website? Uh, yeah. So I, uh, a few, I think everyone on the podcast so far is someone I know personally. So th- cool. that makes it easy. And then they refer their friends, but I also, and I would encourage any of your listeners and you and anybody to do this, mm-hmm. that when I read a book by an author that I like, I everybody is very findable. And I will reach out to them and write them a letter and tell them like, hey, I really loved your book. And yeah. most of them get back to you. 
You know, yeah. some of them get back to you with a very terse thank you, and some of them get back to you with a really thoughtful response to whatever whatever I wrote to them. So uh, that's that's one way I found guests. A couple of my upcoming guests are uh, are authors that I really respect, whose work is very important and well known, and that's how we connected. Was I just wrote them and said, "I loved your book. Here's some specific reasons why," and we struck up a correspondence. I didn't write to them and say, "I love your book. Please be on my podcast." I <laughs> I try to start with like, I loved your book. This doesn't even require a response. Here's some specific things I liked about it. And I'd love yeah. to talk to you more, but I won't be offended if you're too busy to talk to me. And some nice. people are too busy to talk to you. And most people are happy to talk to you. So that's been that's my experience. Anyway. So what would your goal for your podcast be? What would you like, you know, five months, six months from now, where would you like your podcast to be? I My ultimate goal for the podcast is uh, to have a community of people who like to read and write books and are in you know communication with each other through the podcast. So uh, I would love to have it's it's gaining more steam. You know the more the more I think I only have eight episodes out and each one mm-hmm. gets downloaded more than the last one. So people are telling each other about it, which is great. And I would love to have it be a forum where writers who have just written a book can come on and rather than doing their book tour stump speech that they always have to do, they can come on and talk about something completely different. And then the audience can get to know them. And then maybe think, oh, I should read this guy's book, even though he just talked about something that's completely off his area of expertise. You know, she was really interesting talking about that. So I'll yeah. read her book. Um, the book's got to be good. Yeah. yeah. And the worst case yeah. scenario is writers love talking about books. So the worst case scenario is we record a podcast episode and we enjoy it. <laughs> you, hey, know? you could do worse, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So would you like to... Um like have more interviews with writers or people who just love, love books. Is is that your ideal? Yeah. I, I, I haven't figured it out yet. Basically yeah. I've just been handpicking people who feel right to me yeah. and that's, oh, I don't they have totally a rule, work. you know, yeah, yeah, I love it. I think your podcast is great. Thank I've you. listened to all the episodes at this point, I think. Oh, so you. yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I'm so happy you reached out to me. You're very easy to talk to. So thank you. I can imagine your guests enjoy that too. <laughs> yeah, who has time to prepare? You know, I, it's yeah. my mom, as a, you know, one of the things she told me is, you know, if you know your shit, you don't have to prepare. Yeah. So you just spend your yeah. life preparing for anything and then you're yeah. fine in any given situation. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to love this coming episode on Friday. Uh, it's my, a friend of mine from high school who's a water rights attorney and deals with water what? in the Western United States, which no way. Is, it, it's an insane topic. And uh, I, I was really excited to learn about it but it's a, yeah wow. it's a good episode it's one of the first ones we recorded um like i really like i say this on every episode but i'm like i really want people to like talk to me about this stuff because i i love talking about all of the topics that we cover on the podcast and so um you know and i guess it's a little bit i don't know it's just a little bit different so mine's a smaller podcast if 10 people were emailing me weekly i could totally keep up with that you know yeah. so um I'm, yeah. i'd be and I'd be happy to. I love, uh, you know, I love, I love talking about this stuff, and I love talking about it in more depth. How do you inc- like? How do you like people to contact you? Do you want them to email you? Go to your website because yeah, you've got a website, decent website, lucascantymusic yeah. yeah, you can email me right. My phone number's on there. You could literally call me up and start yelling at me about water rights or Middle March, and I would totally talk to you. Um, and, I will. Yeah, please, make that a no. Please do that. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Oh, I love talking to you. This is so so easy. You make it super easy. So thank you. Yeah, it should be easy, right? Thanks so much, Lucas. Have a good one. Bye. That's all for this episode of Audiobook Reviews in 5. Thanks for listening. If you have not yet done so, please follow us on Facebook and subscribe to Audiobook Reviews in 5 on Anchor, Apple, Spotify, and many others. By subscribing, you help increase the profile of this podcast and chances of other listeners finding it. I look forward to checking in with you all again soon. Please stay safe and be well.